Hello and welcome to the Toronto Geometry Colloquium. This is a weekly web series all about geometry processing. The Toronto Geometry Colloquium aims at promoting young researchers and researchers from traditionally underrepresented communities. Every week, we're going to have an opener talking about their cutting edge research for 10 minutes, followed by a headliner giving us a keynote presentation. And this week, our topic focused more on human computer interactions. And our opener, Joshua Lenity, is going to talk about supporting reference imagery for digital drawing. And our headliner, Dr. Alexa Xu, is going to talk about advancing access to non-visual graphics, haptics, and all the representations for of 3D information and data. If you have any questions, please leave comments in the YouTube chat or the Discord channel. So first, it is my great, great pleasure to introduce uh, our opener, Josh. He just graduated from the University of Toronto this year, supervised by Professor Fanny Chevalier and Alec Jacobson. And the cool thing about Josh is that before he joined our lab, he's actually a professional illustrator with very impressive achievement. His artwork was used in several books as a cover page and as a poster for several events. And more importantly, part of the reason why our colloquium can have so many beautiful posters is thanks to Josh. So in today's talk, Josh is going to leverage experience as a professional artist to talk about a new design tool he developed. It is a rare opportunity to see a professional artist inventing a truly useful tool for artists. So without further ado, please join me to welcome Josh. Thank you so much. Just quickly going to share my screen. You can probably see this. I hope we're good to go. Um, so yes, uh, thank you again for having me. Um, my name is Josh Holinetti and I'm a recent master's graduate from the University of Toronto. And I'll be presenting uh, the work I created during my time there with um, my supervisors, Alec Jacobson and Fanny Chevalier on reference imagery for digital drawing. Um, I'm very excited to be presenting here today at the joint Toronto Geometry Colloquium and Tomato Graph. So this is very exciting and thanks for having me. So first, what do we mean when we say reference imagery? So essentially reference is any image that an artist might use to assist them in creating a new work, like drawing from a photograph or perhaps another artwork. Or if detail recreation is the sort of important goal of the artist, um, they might you know, trace their reference imagery. But reference can be used for more interpretive reasons as well. Perhaps the artist wants to pull inspiration from other artworks, styles, color palettes, or any combination of the above. And reference Im imagery is not really a new concept either. It's sort of been with us forever. Artists have long adopted new ways of bringing reference subjects closer to their canvas, such as the camera obscura and the camera lucida, both by projecting, both project the uh, subject onto their um, canvas and allow for new levels of realism and detail. And again, reference imagery is not exclusive to uh, drawing either, you know, uh, sculptors, for example, might use reference imagery when creating artworks. But for our research, we're interested in reference alongside digital drawing specifically. And we wonder, uh, how do artists use reference with today's digital tools and how can they be better supported in this regard? So before I dive in, here's a quick little teaser video of the novel sketch-based interface we designed, which basically automatically presents reference imagery to the working artist. Uh, now let's look at what brought us to this interface. So first, to better understand reference as part of this digital drawing process, we conducted uh, formative interviews with some experienced artists to better understand how reference is used and the challenges involved. Artists uh, provided us with photos of their workspaces to demonstrate how they use their reference, which you'll see in the next slides. So here are some of the main takeaways from our interviews, but please refer to our paper for a more, more thorough breakdown. So not surprisingly, our interviewed artists described using reference for the same reasons I just spoke about. Um, mostly it's because it's hard to draw subjects from memory. Um, or maybe because, you know, the artist is searching for some form of inspiration to uh, affect their artwork. Maybe it's a color palette. But how artists use reference varies greatly, and many adopted into their workflows using a variety of different strategies. So this artist here, for example, we can see that they're viewing their reference with multiple monitors side by side. And this is perfectly suitable for observational reference, but if the artist wants to say trace over the image for a more complicated artwork or task, they would have to import their reference imagery directly into their software. 
um, which is what we see here. But importing reference into your software can also result in tedious image management issues. You know, imagine there, there's like a hundred um, art layers in your Photoshop file and you have to find your reference image. So like P14 said, you know, you have to keep turning your reference on and off and that can be inconvenient. So for some software, there's a risk that importing reference will obscure the artwork and process when it's overlaid onto the digital canvas, like we see here. In other software, like say, Illustrator, images can be placed around the artboard, um, <clears throat> but this can also be a big mess. As P3 said, you know, this is still better than switching between different applications or multiple windows. Um, and of course, when viewing reference alongside a canvas in different software, like we see here, we see Photoshop beside an image viewer, the canvas has to become that much smaller in order to make room for the reference. Um, so regardless of the approach, it seems like there are always, you know, screen real estate issues and visual real estate is quite valuable to the working artist. One danger with reference imagery is this concept of design fixation, which is basically the inadvertent overcopying of source material or more formally a blind adherence to a set of ideas or concepts limiting the output of conceptual design. I won't, prefer, I won't provide a, a thorough background on design fixation here, but if you're curious to learn more, there's plenty of awesome literature out there um, that is particularly interested in its nuanced relationship with creativity. So without being prompted on this concept specifically, artists we interviewed brought up many concerns that relate to design fixation when using reference, such as you know, a fear of staring at reference imagery too long and unintentionally copying it, um, and some, you know, artists described not even importing reference at all into their software because they felt it was just too much of a, a risk that they might copy it or trace it. Um, and some even described, you know, Googling, you know, intentionally finding like low quality images, like pixelated images or blurry images um, to prevent the amount of details they could potentially fixate upon. So we know that artists will use a lot of reference in their workflow. And this can be a problem for you know, visual real estate. On the other hand, there's also value in having reference imagery not visible, right? To help guard against design fixation. So how do we balance this, this tension of wanting to have reference imagery, but also not wanting it to be visible? So informed by all our, our interviews and armed with this better understanding of reference, we designed a novel sketch-based interface in form of a technology probe. That is, it's basically a research instrument slash interface that lets us log how artists use reference imagery, as well as act as an open-ended and fully functional prototype aimed at inspiring users to think of new kinds of interactions and possible design solutions. So in short, a technology probe is a handy tool where you know a deliberate lack of certain functionality, <clears throat> excuse me, might be chosen in an effort to provoke the user. So here we are, finally at our interface. I mean, technology probe. At the core of our probe is this concept of reference regions. And basically these are portions on the canvas that can be associated with a reference image. So that when an artist, you know, when their stylus enters this region, the image automatically displays. And when their stylus exits, the image disappears. Um, tracing was a very common use of reference described by our artists and our interface makes this easy as well, where whenever an image intersects its associated region, it automatically becomes transparent, allowing for easy tracing. So we can see here the artist is drawing, you know, this portrait um, and instead of having to manually toggle this reference on and off, they can just move their wrist to the side, see what, how their drawing looks and then get back to drawing. Um, we also try to, you know, incorporate some built-in features to mitigate um, design fixation. So in our probe, you can blur or pixelate images. And we also implemented this timer so that, you know, you could set a timer to a reference image so that after X amount of time, it will automatically hide, you know. Again, this like trying to address design fixation. Let's see what happens. Uh, so from our interviews, we came up with this concept of the spectrum of reference, which reveals the potential placement of reference material in relationship to the artist's intent. So on the far left side, you know, the goal is strictly detail recreation. So like tracing. And here the reference material will likely be on the canvas. <clears throat> As you move further along the spectrum, you know, detail recreation becomes less important and reference might, you know, um, be used for more interpretive reasons. And the imagery located, might be located further away from the canvas. 
So using this um, spectrum of reference, we designed a set of drawing tasks in an attempt to ensure that reference in our tool could be used in a variety of ways. So we asked artists to draw a portrait, draw a imaginary fictional machine, and draw a sofa slash couch in the same style of some provided images. So we recruited 13 artists to complete these tasks and all artists were provided with the same set of reference images. And let's look at how artists used reference to create drawings using our probe. So we logged where artists place regions on their canvas and where they place reference images in their screen space. And uh, is this image not, there we go, now it's playing. Okay, so those, those rectangles on the left, that just shows where they place the regions. And on the right, it's sort of a snapshot of their, their desktop to show where the images were placed. So this was the most common strategy, which we called region over subject, where artists would basically place their regions so that they would see their reference material when they were drawing the subject at hand. Um, conversely, a few artists adopted this other strategy we call region away from subject. Here, regions were placed away from where the artist intended to draw. So this approach forced artists to sort of internalize their reference material before drawing because they can only see the reference when they're not drawing. Uh, even though we saw occurrences of every strategy in every task, this particular approach was adopted more frequently in tasks that were more interpretive and, you know, detailed recreation wasn't as important to the artist. Tracing was also adopted by many of our artists using our probe and particularly during task one and task two where tracing, I mean, where detail recreation was important. Interestingly though, uh, the fixation mitigation features provided in our probe were not really leveraged in our user study, um, even though artists described these as being beneficial and desirable. For the timer functionality, maybe because it just simply isn't needed. Um, as A3 said in their exit interview, gliding over regions was timer enough and they would just pull away if they didn't want to see the reference anymore. But we do see this generally as an opportunity to explore further, how would this look um, what would we learn if artists were asked to use this probe in a you know longer term with you know such more in more open-ended tasks that weren't you know so specific? Maybe that would reveal more information. Um, next slide. Here we go. So to conclude, um, we learned quite a bit in this research. In particular, there's this really interesting tension between an artist's desire to look at reference images while also mitigating design fixation at the same time. And, you know, it's pretty safe to say that all artists will use reference at some point. It's a natural and exciting part of the creative process and there's nothing wrong with it. But how we support reference, uh, I think could be improved. Uh, and also it should accommodate the wide variety of workflows out there. So, you know, we basically proposed this, we, we proposed an approach that builds on user proximity for automatic image presentation. It was simple and effective. And we found that it, you know, found this balance in this tension that we described earlier and was also very much appreciated by our artists. And we see a lot of exciting potential in this space. You know, how could such, you know, reference regions work in other domains like 3D modeling, writing, or even, you know, audio recording. Um, and you know, there's other ways we can just build upon the simple tool that we have now, right? Like how can we prompt new reference images that resemble the imported reference? Or, or maybe we can suggest reference region layouts depending on what the artist is working on. It's ripe for um, exciting new work. And that brings me to the end of my talk. So thanks again to um, the Toronto Geometry Colloquium and Tomato Graph for having me here uh, and to the U of T and the Dynamic Graphics Project and NSERC for supporting our research. And of course, to my co-authors, Alec Jacobson and Fanny Chevalier. Thank you, Josh, for this great, great talk. And so as usual, we will proceed to the talk of our headliner and have a joint Q&A at the end. So now it is my great honor to introduce our headliner, Dr. Alex Shu. So she is a research scientist at Adobe Research. And before that, she obtained her PhD at the Stanford University, supervised by Professor Xiang Fulmer. And her research mainly focused on HCI and accessibility. For example, how can we uh, turn the music into a haptic response so that we can kind of touch this music? Or how can we create a 3D modeling tool for visually impaired users to create 3D shapes? So many of our graphics work are focusing on creating beautiful like beautiful shades, beautiful images, but we, fail, we often fail to consider how to make our work more accessible for people with disabilities. And Alex's research provides us bridge to, between 
to bridge our research with like those people with disabilities. So, so without further ado, let's welcome Alexa to talk about uh, this important topic on accessible graphics. Thanks for that introduction. I'm very excited to be here um, and present on this work. Uh, let me just share my slides. Right. Um, yeah, very excited to be here and present on my work uh, on advancing access to non-visual graphics. The ability to interpret and use graphical representations is critical for learning and participation in many areas, especially in many STEM disciplines. Scientific diagrams, for example, allow readers to reason about abstract concepts. Models allow visualizing phenomena that might not be directly observable. And uh, data charts present numerical or categorical values in a way that facilitates identifying trends and patterns more easily. Uh, but much of this work um, has been done exploring visual representation. And as a result, people who are blind and visually impaired are often excluded from participation. And this problem on lack of access to spatial information is among the most pervasive information access challenges that are faced by people who are blind, having detrimental effects on a person's uh, education, career, and independence. So through this talk, I hope to convince you that many of the accessi inaccessibility challenges are really ability mismatches. But the key problem has been uh, access to technology and interactions that support the abilities of people who are blind. A result of systems created without considering users' abilities, thus requiring constant adaptation. Instead, I will present projects uh, that try to shift towards the notion of ability-based design, where the user's changing abilities and surrounding context drive changes in the system, providing people with the tools to reach their fullest potential. So let me just illustrate this with a brief example um, of navigating with a white cane. Uh, so, uh, Blind users uh, might use a white cane to navigate and understand uh, the space around them. Um, and from uh, using uh, the white cane, users draw from a combination of haptic and auditory cues. And while a cane may seem like a very simple aid, several aspects can affect the perception of the sounds and haptics. For example, the different techniques that are used to interrogate the environment from each the user can gain different pieces of information. And then different cane styles affect how the sounds and haptics are transmitted and perceived by the user. Examining both the haptic perception and behavior characteristics in this context reveal important design choices and requirements when thinking about designing a haptic user interface uh, for the blind. In one project, I applied these observations to design and prototype a white cane haptic controller to support users' ability to understand and navigate virtual environments. So here in this video, a user is exploring a room in virtual reality. As the user taps and sweeps the cane, they get haptic and auditory feedback from the collisions and textures of the different materials in the room, all of which help in providing an understanding of the space. And this type of application uh, supports blind users in leveraging their known expertise and skills in wayfinding in the real world to enable exploration uh, of virtual spaces. So while uh, VR may seem initially as a predominantly visual experience, here we demonstrate the possibilities of providing a multi-sensory experience, opening opportunities for other applications, uh, such as an orientation and mobility training, as well as planning and previewing routes. So in my research, driven by a practice-based paradigm of research and action research, I have worked with the blind community across three specific sites of information access access to 3D design, uh, data, and virtual spaces, which I just briefly touched on. And today I want to uh, discuss more in depth specifically access to 3D graphics and data visualization. So typically when uh, blind users uh, interact with graphics through digital devices, uh, they use assistive technologies such as uh, uh, text-to-speech technology, commonly referred to as screen readers, and refreshable braille displays, which provide some touch feedback. Both of these technologies allow real-time access to content. And in the past decade, as more information has moved from print to digital, both of these have dramatically improved access to content. 
but there is still much left to support, uh, especially in the area of graphical content, as both of these technologies really focus on providing access strictly to text-based content. And there's uh, a huge gap in supporting access to spatial graphics. Let's take, for example, this image from a textbook depicting a polit political map colored by regions with labels, a legend, and different annotations. And here on the right uh, is an image description, which if provided would uh, provide alternative access uh, to what's contained in this image through a user's assistive technology. But for spatial graphics, verbal descriptions lack precision and have a much higher cognitive load for interpretation when compared to a direct perceptual interface. Text-based access is simply not sufficient uh, for many of the tasks for which graphics are used. And graphics are not just static. As more content moves through a digital format, it offers sighted users not just real-time and fast updates, but also capabilities for interactive manipulation and exploration, allowing users to gain a deeper understanding of the information. On the other hand, uh, with accessible materials, especially tactile material, uh, production can be considerably uh, slow. Production requires often uh, skilled specialists and most commonly result in static and unimodal output. Like hard copy tactile graphics, uh, such as uh, the figure shown on the left or 3D printed models. As a result, access can be slow. Users constantly rely on sighted intermediaries uh, to support, uh, to support uh, under understanding of the content. And moreover, content can really quickly be outdated if there are any changes to that information. In a national survey of students' perceptions on the use of tactile graphics to support classroom instruction, only 44% of blind students indicated that they have access to graphical materials when their peers are also using graphics for instruction. So if equitable access is to scale and if STEM is to be more inclusive of people who are blind, we need to explore new technologies that support not only independent access, but also interactive and dynamic access. These technologies need to support multimodal access, including haptic, auditory, and speech modalities. And to be successful, they need to consider the relevant task and the perceptual capabilities of each modality. Towards this, um, in the first part of my talk, I'll focus on access to 3D information and, de and design. I'll describe how we began our investigation by understanding how to support haptic display of complex 3D information, and then how we work with co-designers to define interactions that support uh, understanding manipulation and exploration uh, of 3D information uh, for authoring new content. And then in the second part uh, of my talk, I'll focus on access to data. Uh, I'll describe how we began our investigation by understanding blind users' current experiences, preferences, and needs in the space, observing how users access data to different sources, and then how we work with co-designers to explore different data experiences um, using primarily sound and speech to be easily available over the web. So while both of these uh, areas of work span to different application areas, both support our common goal of advancing access to non-visual spatial representation by addressing the different needs I outlined previously. In both, we investigate haptic and auditory displays to complement text-based representations to create more inclusive access to graphical materials. So with that, let me dive a little deeper in our efforts to support access to 3D design. Here, our work focused on supporting access to 3D information, which is used in many areas. Examples include science models and education to support various design activities as well as prototyping and engineering simulation. For people who learn and work non-visually, getting access to quality graphics and 3D models is even more essential. It is important not only having, uh, not only understanding such representations, but also being able to create and produce this type of media to support learning and working. And part of the challenge with uh, accessible authoring workflows, especially on interaction side, is that many of the typical 3D design applications 
rely on interaction styles like direct manipulation that are often not compatible with assistive technology like screen readers, which I described previously. Programming based tools for 3D modeling, on the other hand, uh, such as OpenSCAD, address some of the issues on the input side, uh, since it relies mostly on text based input. And there have been several efforts from within the blind community to create uh, more accessible instructional materials. However, there aren't any good methods to obtain feedback on the created geometry. So user, users either have to uh, 3D print a version of their design and wait long periods between iterations or mentally keep track of the source code to understand the state of their design. To address this lack of feedback, we investigated how 2.5D shape displays could provide haptic feedback and better support programming tasks for 3D design. So I'll just provide first an overview of our workflow. Uh, so in our workflow, uh, users type code, which when compiled, renders the physical model on the shape display. This users can then haptically explore the model uh, and apply different operations before 3D printing uh, and obtaining a higher resolution model. We use participatory design methods to work with co-designers from the blind community to understand the challenges and interactions that they face, um, and especially to uh, understand what uh, interactions we needed to support uh, to enable authoring. Through design sessions, we work with makers uh, with varying visual abilities and balanced programming skills. I'll present some general findings on interactions that support our specific application for 3D design, but also uh, more general findings applicable in other contexts for 3D information. So this include one, supporting multiple perspectives, two, understanding uh, or communicating the display limitations to the user, and three, bringing attention to changes. So first, on supporting multiple perspectives. With traditional 2D tactile graphics, multiple views are generally discouraged uh, because through touch with the more limited views available in 2D material, it can be more challenging to identify correspondences between the multiple views uh, in a render object. But for 3D authoring, multiple perspectives are really critical to understand the entire object's geometry and even more so to be able to make successful modifications. Uh, so with the shape display in our workflow, we define uh, interactions for object manipulation that allow a user to translate, rotate, and scale objects and get different perspectives and levels of details in the object. The additional depth skews that are provided by the shape display uh, facilitate finding correspondences between the different views uh, more easily uh, and making use of the perspective. So here's a, use, a video that I'll play of a user that has created a 3D model. In the video, you will see and hear the user rotating the object with one hand and filling the different sides of the object with another, verifying his design before diagnosing a problem. Yeah, the problem is I just don't have it centered on the uh, above the cube, so let's... Let's see what I can do about that. Freeform dots sphere. Okay. Um, so co-designers described that while this um, access to the multiple perspectives allowed integration uh, and understand a detailed understanding of the object, it could also be slow when they just wanted to get a really quick overview. One co-designer provided a comparison saying, if I had a real object, it would be less work if I could just feel both sides at the same time. So additionally, we define interactions that better support global apprehension by allowing a user to use multiple hands to get a quicker overview. So in this video, with split view on, a user renders a top-down view and a bottom-up view of the mug that they can explore uh, using multiple hands. Okay, and uh, okay, uh, second, uh, understanding display limitations. There are several technical limitations uh, with the shape display that limit the representation fidelity. For example, being able to show overhangs or internal cuts. And this incongruence in representations can be really confusing for the user. With traditional tactile media, uh, occlusions uh, is a concept that is difficult to convey. And perception studies on haptic search have shown that occlusion compared to other common transformations like scaling or rotation most significantly impact tactile shape recognition. 
with a shape display, one interaction technique that worked well to allow haptic integration and understanding of internal geometry was to slice the model to view, uh, to view uh, the internal parts. So in this video, a user is exploring a mug on its side. Uh, with section view, the user can observe the inner walls and geometry by slicing the object. This type of interaction uh, is similar to cut sectional tools in several 3D modeling applications, but it's even more important here where tactile transparency views are not possible. Okay, and last, bringing attention to changes. Because the haptic field of view is smaller and exploration slower relative to vision, it's even more crucial that effective methods are used not only to catch users' attention, but also to guide users' attention to important changes uh, that need to be investigated. So in our 3D design workflow to alert users or, or to bring users' attention to areas of the 3D model that are clipping and might not be visible given the small workspace, we use motion of the fins as well as auditory cues. We conducted an evaluation with five users to understand the usability and need of some of these interactions. In the study, users completed a set of control tasks that measure knowledge in specific 3D modeling concepts and then a freeform task. All our users were uh, blind and had no prior experience with 3D modeling. So I'll just briefly share some of the objects users created specifically in, more, in the freeform task. So this slide uh, shows some, of, uh, some examples of those objects and a small description that users provided of what they wanted to create. So P1, for example, created a sturkey stand consisting of four cubes stacked in ascending order. P3 created a truck with carriers composed with cubes. P4 created shape art, a cube with a dome on top. Um, overall, participants reported being satisfied with the results and thought the objects matched what they initially wanted to create. The results were encouraging that users could effectively use the feedback and that interaction techniques we investigated allowed successful exploration uh, and manipulation of several 3D modeling concepts. Uh, here's one of our co-designers and collaborators, Son Kim, describing this experience. What really is so awesome is I can view various perspectives of the object and not just the object in its single state. For example, you can see the bottom of a cup and the, the top of a cup. So the top would be hollow, the bottom would be pretty solid. And or you can rotate the object so you have various perspectives that you can tactily view. Um, and that offers greater dimension to understanding the object that you're attempting to make. And that's the same opportunity that a sighted peer would have. Okay, uh, an essential part of this workflow was dynamic and iterative feedback, uh, which participants describe as really often lacking in currently available methods. As one participant described it, no trouble with the hardware or flow of the system, the feedback will make it easier, makes it possible for a blind person to create. This connects to a broader theme from both the participatory design and evaluation on the general lack of design tools that blind individuals can use independently, but also the great enthusiasm from users wanting to take the role of designers to create content by and for the blind community. And so this quote from one, uh, one of our co-designers captures the sentiment. This user said, I would like to be able to help designers in my department. A lot of the work we do is in tactile design. And that's something that I currently don't have access to because the tools we use aren't accessible. So the fact that I would be able to use a tool that I could control and could actually create and design 3D models is just revolutionary and very exciting. To summarize, uh, in this piece of access to 3D design, I detailed our investigation on how to support access to 3D information. Uh, through our participatory design process, I detail the challenges and interactions that are important to consider. Uh, we can take advantage of even low resolution tactile displays uh, in complement with other modalities and interaction techniques to make the 3D information not just accessible, uh, but actionable and useful for users who are blind. I also described two general areas that are important to consider for 3D information and haptic interaction. These are uh, one, supporting multiple perspectives, making it easy for users to identify correspondences, allowing access to both a uh, global perspective as well as different levels of detail. Uh, second, communicating technical display limitations. Uh, those limitations can result in representation incongruencies or mismatches. So instead, we need to support additional strategies for apprehension that allow resolving uh, these mismatches. 
And last, the importance of bringing attention to changes, uh, especially uh, with uh, haptic exploration. Exploration is more uh, part to whole, gaining uh, the details and then bring, building up the big picture, uh, as opposed to vision, where you tend to focus first on the big picture and then dive into the details. I described specific scenarios of how each of this were important in supporting our to-do design workflow, but many of these general interaction techniques and patterns are important to consider in other areas uh, for 3D information display. Okay, so uh, next I, I want to discuss uh, the second part of this work on increasing access to data on the web. And data is another important source of information uh, that is predominantly presented visually, uh, but has a lot, uh, is also connected uh, to the idea of uh, leveraging our, our ability for spatial uh, processing. And throughout the decade, we have seen the rapid growth of data visualization. Recent events from the COVID-19 pandemic highlighting the highlighted the value of data visualization to inform and guide uh, important decisions. Uh, flattening the curve, for example, was a central public health strategy and news organizations uh, numerous independent websites, uh, as well as uh, every state in the US launched at least one website with updates and data dashboards to keep the public informed. At the same time, anecdotal ev evidence that was reported in the general media captures some of the barriers faced by the blind community in obtaining proper access to vital COVID-19 information in their local communities, particularly graphical representations. And prior work uh, has investigated web accessibility across activities like browsing, email, social media, and productivity tools, uh, which have helped inform practices and new technologies. But few have investigated users' experiences when accessing data. To fill these gaps, we conducted an online survey and remote contextual inquiry with blind users to understand the space better. Our survey results revealed that respondents placed high importance in accessing data uh, driven media, with 63% of respondents describing it as very too extremely important. At the same time, users reported encountering data driven media frequently, at least once per week to once per day. However, most respondents had concerns on access to timely information. 94% of respondents reported having concerns about accessing accurate uh, information in a timely manner with available accessibility. As I had previously described, the most common way in which blind users interacted with graphical content uh, was through image descriptions. Uh, for a data chart like the one I'm showing on this slide, descriptions can vary widely. Uh, so here, it, uh, the description uh, can be as descriptive and detailed as this uh, paragraph with multiple sentence, or as concise and more interpretive as this uh, single sentence where only the main insight is communicated. Uh, but similar to before, we know that uh, how language is not great for spatial information and really lacks precision. In our study, our contextual inquiry here, we observed how descriptions lead to decreased confidence and trust on the information. Uh, participants acknowledge specifically that when they access descriptions, they know that they are relying on somebody else's subjective interpretation of the information. So they cannot be sure that their insights are accurate. Furthermore, uh, participants recognize that descriptions can vary in quality and can be done poorly. Descriptions only capture the information that the author uh, of the description chose to include. And with data that is automatically updated, descriptions often lag behind and easily become outdated, creating a mismatch between what uh, users re might receive with their assistive technology versus what, is, what might be visually presented. A more novel representation, but less common that we observed was audiographics through sonification. So with audiograph, data values are mapped to non-speech sounds such as piano notes. So I'll play an example uh, of what this means here. So I'm going to play this short clip and you'll hear a sequence of notes. The higher the pitch, the higher the data value. And this is what that represents uh, visually. We observed uh, novice to expert users being able to easily familiarize and extract general trends of the data using uh, sonification. 
However, this became more difficult with more complex graphics uh, to be able to remember all the sounds. So with more features in the data, there are more things to remember and audio is strongly, or, or consuming audio is strongly temporal, uh, which poses some restrictions. So for contrast, I, so for contrast, here's a more complex uh, data set for COVID positivity rate in Peru. Um, I'll play a clip and again, you'll hear a sequence of notes. Uh, so with this type of uh, this method, users also frequently commented on how they lack context to map the sounds to graph concepts. So uh, while they might uh, be able to know the direction of the sound, uh, the pitch being higher or lower, um, it's harder to connect that to uh, what the graph actually is conveying. And then another general theme was participants expressing their expertise with tactile graphics, but less experience with audio graphics, such that they were less confident they could make ac an accurate interpretation. So just to highlight some of the needs we identified, specifically when thinking about audio-based methods for data consumption, we need to be able to one, uh, support users with varying uh, data literacy skills, helping guide novice users without prior training. To provide access to more complete information, a common theme ac across the study was that accessible representations only provide access to certain parts of the information and leave others out. Uh, three, uh, increased users' trust and confidence in gaining their own insights. Users want to be able to have direct access and be able to make their own interpretation. And last, use low-cost commodity hardware and software to be easily available, particularly on the web, as well as robust to different assistive technologies that a user might rely on. With the insights we learned from this study, uh, one method that we have been investigating to address these needs is audio data narratives. Uh, specifically, we're investigating being able to bring together the benefits of descriptions and sonification. Uh, so using the descriptions as, or narratives to guide the user uh, while uh, using sonification to maintain users access or direct access to the data. To define design principles for this type of representation or define what does it mean to create an effective audio narrative, we conducted virtual design workshops with blind and visually impaired co-designers. Our exploration centered on generating ideas on how we might make audio graphics easier to navigate and interpret through a narrative, uh, testing different designs on their ease of interpretability. I'll highlight two main points of commonality across some of the prototypes that came out of it uh, with our co-designers. First, uh, in structuring information in an auditory narrative. For complex data set, users prefer segmenting uh, a sonification and listening by prominent or salient features that made it easier to identify, investigate, and remember uh, its parts. Uh, so in this data, uh, for example, displaying feature by feature in the data, preserving specific trends per segment, like the rise up and down, as well as highlighting key parts like an outlier. Second, foreshadowing. Users wanted coordinated access between description and sonification with the speech always preceding uh, the sonification to help guide their attention by providing commentary on upcoming uh, prominent features. This context was really important to better situate and be able to interpret the sounds and connect them to the graph concept. So here is an example that I'll play of one way in which one co-designer explained using the sonification and description to better emphasize a small change in the audio. And I'll play, I'll play the clip now. Adoption of landline telephones started at a low 10% in 1920 and quickly increased. Then the depression came and it dropped quickly but came back up. So overall, um, from uh, this exploration, we see an audio narrative needs to uh, be able to one, support attention to salient regions, to support memory and recall by helping users group features, and three, provide relevant context such that users can connect perceptual to conceptual levels, um, basically creating a better expectation of the audio. We applied these insights to develop an automatic approach to generating a data narrative given a data set. 
our approach aims to combine a description and sonification in a perceptually salient manner driven by the design patterns we uncovered from our code design sessions. Uh, to achieve this, we pose a problem of generating an optimal audio narrative as a segmentation problem, where our goal is, given a data set, we want to find a narrative composed of speech and sonification segments. Uh, here, I visually depict the overall narrative as a blue bar, the green as a uh, description segments, and then the yellow as a sonification segments, which include different features in the data. And we solve this problem using dynamic programming driven by a set of heuristics. I'll summarize some of this uh, guiding heuristics uh, that drive uh, this process. First, we want to maintain the rhythmic pattern in each segment. Auditory perception has a high temporal resolution, is sensitive to rhythm and its changes. Uh, so pattern sequences of notes are remembered more easily uh, than the less structured and random combinations. Uh, second, we want to prioritize a moderate uh, number of segments. So for a complex data set, like the one I showed before, we don't just want to show a single segment of all the information at once. As co-designers describe this as having too much to keep track of. But we also don't want too many uh, switches between description and sonification, as this would require the user to constantly have to switch their attention uh, and likely impact workload. And last, we want to prioritize a moderate duration of each segment. Detecting a pattern in an auditory stream requires some buildup, uh, and prior work has pointed to an ideal time frame up to 10 to 12 seconds. So uh, with the sonification data segments, the last step is the language generation. And speech always precedes the data to provide context and set the expectation. To determine the speech preceding each segment, we use simple template descriptions to uh, generate the relevant uh, text. Applying this process, I'll show you now an example uh, for this data set on COVID positivity rate in Peru. And uh, here, uh, visually, each segment is shown in different colors. And I'll just play a clip of just the first part. COVID positivity rate in Peru. In February 2020, COVID rate was 0.0% and then it increased sharply to all-time high of 37.7% in April 2020. It sounded like this. Okay, um, so then we evaluated this method against the standard sonification representation testing two factors. First, we tested the representation type. Um, so users access the audio representation in, uh, in one of two ways. Uh, first, uh, as a narrative uh, with shorter interleaved segments of description uh, followed by sonification. So this is a narrative condition uh, or they access it without segments, uh, a complete description followed by uh, the complete sonification. And this is our control condition. Both conditions had the same duration. The only difference was in how the information was presented. As a second factor, we also uh, included data sets of different complexity. Um, so the simple data sets had two segments while more complex data sets had four segments. We hypothesized that the narrative using segments would allow users to gain a better gist of the data by guiding their attention compared to having no segments. And secondly, the, uh, the narrative representation would help users better interpret the sounds by immediately providing the relevant context. To test this, we recruited 16 screen reader users who participated in the evaluation remotely. For one of our metrics, we asked participants to provide a description and takeaways uh, that they got from the data after one or two uh, JITs. So on this slide, I'm showing a description of one participant consisting of about six sentences. And so to understand what participants learned from the data, we coded uh, participants' insights based on different data facts. This included data fact types such as extrema uh, and trend. And furthermore, we were interested in how much participants made use of the data tones or sonification to gain an insight, or whether they were just repeating uh, the information that was provided uh, in the description. So additionally, we categorized an insight as exact or inferred. An exact insight in what being information that was repeated exactly from the description or inferred, which was information that was not explicitly spoken, but instead required integrating both the, the, an understanding of the description and sonification. 
Moving on to results, on this slide, I have a plot showing data set complexity, complex and simple on the x-axis, and the proportion of inferred insights on the y-axis. Uh, one line shows the proportion of inferred insights for the control condition. This is a condition without segments. And another for the narrative condition, the condition that had uh, the, the segments. In the narrative condition, uh, we see a significantly higher proportion of inferred insights compared to the control condition without segments. This line is higher up, and the odds are 1.6 times higher that an insight uh, is inferred when consumed through the narrative. In addition, uh, we see that there is an interaction uh, effect with data set complexity. So for the control condition, there is a significant difference in insights between the complex and simple data sets. The simple data set yields a higher number of inferred insights, 29% versus 13%, indicating that participants could make more inferences using the sonification when the data set was simple, but less so when it was more complex. On the other hand, for the narrative condition, there is no significant difference between complex and simple data sets, but for simple data sets, we still see a higher number of inferred insights, 36% versus 30%. So taken together, this provides evidence for our hypothesis that the narrative helps users better interpret and make use of the sonification. Additionally, we observed that this can vary by data set complexity um, and that the narrative condition has an improvement for complex data sets, but not so much for the simple data sets. With the narrative, participants describe their understanding to be more detailed and overall requiring less effort to interpret. And uh, while for the control condition without segments, participants described their understanding as being more general, uh, describing it as a big trend understanding. However, participants described how it allowed them to better appreciate the overall sound compared to the narrative. So to summarize, we investigated the use of description and sonification to improve understanding of data graphs. Our proposed method was motivated by co-designer strategies in how they gain a more detailed understanding of a sonification, as well as prior work on supporting auditory perception. And the evaluation results reveal some of the benefits, but also some of the trade-offs, depending on the data set complexity and in being able to balance an overview versus details. So that brings me to the end with the two projects I wanted to share today uh, more in depth. In the beginning, I mentioned the challenge to others uh, to address needs on the lack of access to spatial information and its importance if we are to increase inclusion. I mentioned the key problem on technology and interactions that support the abilities of people who are blind. And I presented my approach in those two domains, investigating multimodal representations and technologies that support interaction and up-to-date access, better complementing what is currently available to text-based access. Um, I have shown you how our experience uh, of the world can be richly multimodal. How we draw from this, um, from multiple senses as, uh, as well as language to develop a functional spatial layout of the world around us and how we can design multimodal interfaces to support this and minimize ability mismatches. Shifting towards designing for inclusion where more people can participate can itself present us with new opportunities that benefit more people. Whether these are addressing permanent disabilities, like I've shown in several of these projects here, or uh, addressing temporary or even situational impairments. And reflecting more broadly, looking to the past, I noticed how the cycle of exclusion often was a driver in many of our innovations. Our representational styles and modes of interaction have evolved to make it easier and more accessible for everyone to interact with technology. We have moved from temporal symbolic representations to textual to graphical interfaces. From sharing letters to email to images to even more rich content. And while this is an overly simplified timeline, what I want to convey is that this shift have moved us towards exploiting a greater range of our skills and engaging more of our senses, creating inclusion for more to be able to participate and share these experiences. And reflecting on many of the existing solutions that we use to communicate and interact with information today, several have their origins in innovations that uh, were made to remedy exclusion, like the keyboard, email, auto captioning, and touchpad. These were all surprisingly or unsurprisingly innovations that came from addressing needs in the space of accessibility. I'll highlight the story of the creator of GesturePad, Wayne Westerman, who had a hand disability and look 
to enabling gestural input instead of relying on a keyboard, uh, which uh, caused a lot of strain. This technology was later bought by Apple to create the first iPhone incorporating multi-touch gestures that make input more accessible to many today. As disability activist and designer Liz Jackson said, disabled people are the original life hackers, having to navigate a world and systems that require constant adaptation to remedy exclusion. So instead of access to systems uh, designed for disability to work with the, better with the user. I hope I have provided you a glimpse of some of the accessibility challenges in this space and ways in, ways in which we can start shifting towards designing for inclusion through, ability, through the lens of ability-based design, including disabled designers, makers, and professionals throughout the process. Uh, with that, I just want to take a brief moment to acknowledge some of my collaborators, specifically for the two main areas of work that I presented today. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa, for this really inspiring talk. And we will now start our joint Q&A session for both speakers. And in the meantime, if you have other questions, please feel free to post them on the YouTube chat or the Discord channel. And so let's give Alexa a short water break and start with a question for Josh. Like the first question is, is when you determine uh, like which rec rec reference imaginary to recommend, is there a rule of thumb to determine whether this is a good recommendation or a bad recommendation? Well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, because that, like, our, our tool doesn't actually recommend, uh, like, doesn't do any smart recognition, if you will. The user is intentionally choosing one image to associate with that region. So, um, in the current state of it, you know, it's just up to the artist and what they feel is would be a good reference image. But we think that there's really, you know, cool potential here. Say, you um, instead of just you know, choosing one image, you provide a set of images and maybe the tool might, you know, randomly pick an image or maybe every time an image is presented, it sort of, you know, counts a, like counts a little tick. And, you know, we can sort of count, oh, hey, you, the artists have seen this image too many times, whereas this one you've never looked at yet. So why don't we try to throw this one in? So that we still think there's a lot of like really simple approaches we could do to sort of like, you know, suggest, you know, new images to maybe again, potentially mitigate fixation. But again, it's like in the current state, it's all it's all up to the artist right now to just to choose whatever they want. Okay. But but as a like a professional artist, would you want a system that gives you a new uh, image or new reference photos that you've never seen before? Or actually you prefer to just use the ones you 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 already picked? I guess it would depend on the task. I, I think, you know, if I'm drawing, um, say I know I have to draw a lot of boats, you know, say I, say I got hired to draw 10 different boats, you know, there would be a point where I would be tired of probably looking for new reference imagery. So in that case, I would definitely, you know, I would totally accept like some algorithm to spit images at me to make my life easier. Um, I, you know, but yeah, like creativity is so, like artists are finicky, right? They all like, some are really cool with it and some want to have total ownership and don't want anything controlling their creative flow. But I think that that would be really cool. Thanks, thanks for this, this very detailed answer. So the next question is for Alexa. So you showed a very cool demo that a user like walking in the virtual environment with the crane. And I wonder whether similar technique can be used also be used for 3D modeling. For example, instead of using this kind of uh, high field thing to touch the shape, is it possible that a user can wear like a glove and then touch a 3D shape in the virtual environment and receive some haptic feedbacks? Yeah, um, definitely. Thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great, uh, I think that could definitely work. Uh, and there, I guess there would be a few different considerations. Um, but I think one of the, I guess one of the things that was available in that uh, example I showed on the virtual environment was the ability to also get uh, vibrotactile feedback to feel different textures. Um, while in the other approach I showed on the shape display, because you're directly filling the material, it's all one material, there's no distinction. Uh, so yeah, I think there are some benefits of uh, having like a, maybe a combined approach using both. Okay, I understand. Thank you. And the next question is for Josh. And and this is a, like a system question. Is it possible to provide like multiple reference image for the for this for the same space? For example, like if you click a space, there are some image for the pose, and there's another image for like color styles. Like 
do your system supports this? We actually, yeah, one, one thing I actually didn't, uh, one thing I edited out of my talk is there is a, ter a certain region that we do have that we call the global region. So um, a lot of artists that we interviewed also use reference imagery and mood boards. So they want to sort of see all of the reference images at once to sort of inspire how they work. So one of the, you can just check a little box in our interface. And what it will do is, you know, if you enter that region, all of the images that you have associated with your canvas will be presented at once. So there is a way to in fact, see sort of a big picture view of everything at once. Oh, got it. Thank you. And the next question for Alexa is that in the in the last season in our colloquium, we heard a talk from Athena and who showed like a lot of results about how to make graphics for people with visual disabilities. And sometimes things that the perspectives or occlusion of those 3D models can be very confusing. I wonder in your experience, is this kind of thing come up in your, in your I don't know, user studies or in your class research as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, um, I guess in, it depends on uh, people's uh, prior background and experience with a lot of these concepts. Uh, so for example, for the 3D design workflow, uh, none of the users that we work with had a prior experience with 2D modeling as many of these concepts are not like accessible. Uh, so we also, part of it when showing the system to users was also working with like, what is the right training and uh, educational materials to provide? Um, so thinking a lot about like, tactile materials that would convey these concepts that maybe previously were only conveyed in a visual manner, but can be conveyed successfully uh, using tactile materials and other ways, yeah. Oh, okay. And perhaps another follow-up is that, um, so do you think like, uh, because you show like those son sonification for, for those reading those graphs, I'm not sure like whether it is will be cool to kind of hear the sound of a bunny like creating some sonification for any 3D shapes or for them to help them to kind of understand the 3D shape? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's some opportunity of like adding um, also the sonification for like 3D spaces. The challenge there is that um, audio is uh, strongly temporal. So what's mm -hmm. missing from that you get from haptics is like uh, being able to quickly get an overview of the space, like you can just feel everything uh, spatially versus audio, you're really listening sequentially. Uh, and so that there's some missing information there uh, to bring back. So with data shards, they are a little simpler than uh, 2D information. So it's easier to convey that. Uh, but when it, the information becomes more complex and 2D, um, then uh, the user might easily get lost or there might need to be additional strategies um, when you listen to information just sequentially. Yeah, that's and I think they're maybe not just listening, but maybe interacting and being able to query information from different spaces to get an understanding of the space. Oh, so it's more like an interactive thing where user may query like oh, this slice of the shape and then, okay. That's yeah, it. but also maybe having some way to reference where they are, uh, especially mm -hmm. because you're only receiving like very detailed um, specific information, how do you connect that back to what the global picture is? Yeah, thank you. That's a very good point. Thank, thank you. And the next question for Josh is that uh, in your work, you use like reference image for like 2D digital drawings, but we wonder in your opinion, like would this kind of 2D imagery will also be useful for like digital 3D sculpting or do we need other types of like reference objects for like 3D sculpting? Like, well, so right now, for example, in Blender, um, you can like associate an image to like a plane, like the XY plane, so that when you're in that like orthographic view, that image shows up and that's handy for modeling. Uh, but yeah, I like, I do like wonder, like, you know, when you're 3D modeling, like you, you're always rotating your object. So maybe you can have different, you know, images presented just, you know, depending if a portion of your mesh is in view. Um, and, you know, who says that reference just has to be an image too, right? Like maybe in the 3D domain, maybe your reference is another mini model in a viewport that you can even manipulate. Um, one weird, like happy accident that we found in our interface was I accidentally like drag and dropped a PDF into our interface and it, and it actually rendered as like a, you know, a text reference. But then I was oh. like, hey, this is actually something that a lot of artists use as reference as well. Artists don't just use imagery, they use text too, right? Like think about the comic artist drawing based off of a script. So it's like how, like, it's sort of like you can have anything from pile A be reference for anything in pile B. And I think the combinations I, that could be very exciting. You know, you don't, you, it could be anything really that could work for reference. 
Oh, thank you for that. Thank you for the answer. And the, the last question for Alexa is, is actually a very broad question. Is that if I perhaps ask uh, for my own benefits, is that is we like we kind of write papers and render a lot of images and create a lot of shapes, but like personally, I feel like our research is not that accessible for those like visually impaired uh, readers. So I'm one wonder like is there some ways that we can make our research uh, research result more accessible to those people? Yeah, I think um, there's like I would start really with like just the basics of like making sure people can access like information, like say research papers that uh, the PDFs or like whichever uh, type of file that is used for access that that is accessible. Um, and with graphics, um, the very basic is providing uh, a description of uh, what the graphic contains, kind of like what's the main point. Uh, so that a user can have a conversation or even ask more questions on it. So I would start really with even just the basics. And then beyond that, I, I guess uh, there's a lot of um, spaces for improvement here. And, and part of that, what I mentioned there is that a lot of access is very static and um, kind of subjective like descriptions that rely on somebody else to do the effort to make the information accessible. Um, but there are not so many methods that uh, give users agency to be able to interact and manipulate that information. Okay, so yeah. probably we'll need to wait for you to invent new tools for that. Yeah, we'll wait for you to invent new tools for, for making our research more accessible. Yeah, so yeah, I think that's that's the end of the Q&A session. So uh, thank you everyone for joining this colloquium and let's thank our speakers again. And we also want to thank our artist, uh, artist Naomi Clark for making the poster for this week and see you all next week.